Today on Applied Science, we're going to take a practical look at engineered magnetics. I've actually wanted to make this video for a long time because it's common to teach electronics with batteries and wires and make it very understandable. But for some reason, when it comes to magnetics, it's typically taught heavy on the math and the theory. So after watching this video, you'll have a really good conceptual grasp of magnetics. And uh, if you want to design your own transformers or motors, this is a great place to start. So I mentioned batteries and light bulbs, and this is actually a really great place to start. Over here, we've just got a D-cell, some wire, and an incandescent light bulb. And this is even taught in grade school level. I mean, it's pretty clear what's happening here. We've got an electric current that's flowing through the wire, making the light bulb glow, and flowing back into the battery. And then, you know, a few years later, we introduced the concepts of there's, there's a voltage here, and there's a resistance in the light bulb, and then a current flows through here that's determined by the voltage and the resistance. And it's actually almost exactly the same thing for magnetics. Let me show you. So I have a little magnet between these two pieces of steel. And then we've got a steel track here making a circuit and a compass just to show what the field is in this gap here. And then I've got another magnet here just to pull the compass sideways so that we can see when there's no field. And so if I put the uh, thing in here, you can see the compass needle moves, of course, and if I turn it around, it goes the other way. Nothing too shocking just yet. But what to notice is that if I hold the magnet out here and turn it, the compass moves a little bit because the magnetic field can even go through the air. But if I put it into this uh, steel piece, the magnetic field has a much easier time making its way out to the compass. And so to notice, the, the same exact quantities that we get in electric circuits apply to magnetic circuits. We essentially have something like a voltage source, we have something like a resistance, and there's actually a flow through here. A quick note about terminology. Uh, there's actually quite a lot in the field of magnetics, and it makes it hard to understand because there's just so many new terms. And so I've tried really hard in this video to not introduce terms that aren't necessary. But unfortunately, when you go off and search for more information on the internet, they're going to crop up. So we're, we're going to have to cover some. Like, for example, in an electric circuit, we call it resistance when there's an opposition to a flow of current. And in a magnetic circuit, we call it reluctance. And so the trouble is that if you go searching for stuff like magnetic resistance, you won't really find it on the internet. You have to search for reluctance. So I'll do my best to describe each term as it comes up. And keep in mind, we're trying to keep it minimal. Uh, and I'll always do my best to describe them first. It helps a lot to visualize what's going on in here. So I took the magnet with the two steel pieces out of that circuit, and I'm just going to sprinkle some iron filings on here. And you know, you've definitely seen this demo before, uh, but the thing that's important to note is that there's sort of field lines flowing out of the ends and making a circuit, even in air, right? Like everything is an electric circuit, everything is a magnetic circuit. And the trick is that electricity really, really doesn't want to flow through air, so we can usually neglect it in thinking about uh, electric circuits. It's actually very fortunate because all of our circuit boards require air and insulators to work properly. But with magnetics, even though the field doesn't really want to go through air, we'll talk about what the exact numbers are later, it can still make it. And so there's, an, there's a magnetic field flowing around here. And we could do the analysis and figure out just how much is flowing through there uh, based on the uh, reluctance of air. So let's put this into the circuit so you can see how that changes the field lines. Okay, now we'll try the same thing with this in circuit. Notice that there's quite a bit less activity here. And the reason is that these steel pieces are pulling away the magnetic field. It's easier for the magnetic field to flow through these low reluctance pieces of steel uh, rather than flow through the air. So, you know, it's there's two camps on whether you want to anthropomorphize uh, physical phenomenon, but you could say the magnetic field would rather flow through the steel than it would flow through the air. Or you can just think of it in terms of reluctance. The steel has a lower reluctance, and so it conducts more of this magnetism than the air around it. And if we took these gaps out and made it perfect, we would have even less field leaking out into the air. So we've shown that a magnet acts like this source of magnetic force. It's kind of uh, similar to voltage in an electric circuit. But there's an important difference between a magnet and a battery. A battery is an electrical energy source. I mean, it's converting chemical energy into electrical energy, and we're actually pulling uh, electrical energy out and burning it up in this uh, tungsten filament lamp. 
But a magnet is not an energy source. A magnet is much more like a compressed spring. So at the factory, they started with a piece of ma a material that was not magnetic and put a lot of energy into it to make it into a magnet. So think of this as kind of like a compressed spring. So it's providing force for us because it's a, a compressed spring and we can squeeze it harder. Or you can uncompress the spring and get the energy out, but only once. So it's much more like uh, a small storage vessel that's filled up at the factory and you really just can't get you know, forever energy out of it, of course. Okay, let's try something else. So instead of the permanent magnet with the two pieces of steel, I have just a single piece of steel here with about 50 turns of wire wrapped around it. And when I close the switch here, uh, about three amps flows through there and you can see the compass needle turns when I uh, put current through there. So it's as if this piece of steel is becoming a magnet when we put power through and when we stop putting power through, it is no longer a magnet. You could almost say it's a, an electromagnet, right? <laughs> okay, so um, we'll try it with a different material. Let's try a piece of brass. Okay, I'm turning it on and off, and you can see it's the same three amps, and we'll zoom in on the compass so you can see this a little more closely, but there's barely any movement. Okay, now I'm going to switch to another a third type of material. This will be a piece of stainless steel. It may be hard to see, but the compass is actually moving a little bit more than the brass, but less than the steel. So let me uh, switch to a meter so we can actually put some numbers on this instead of just looking at a compass moving. So I've got this magnetic meter that I got from Amazon, and it reads off in units of millitesla. And this is kind of the sensor on the end of this probe here. Uh, a tesla is a unit of magnetic flux density. So it sounds complicated, but really, if you think about these field lines connecting one side of the magnet to the other, the flux are the lines themselves and the density is just how closely packed they are together. So the Tesla is used as a unit of describing kind of how you know, intimidating your magnet is. You know, a, an MRI machine is like a 1.5 Tesla or a three Tesla machine. A large neodymium magnet could be something like half a Tesla at the surface. And so here's a couple of them stuck together with a little space in between. And if we put the probe right on the surface, we're getting about, you know, 460 millitesla. So about half a tesla at the surface. Now, the interesting thing is if I turn the probe 90 degrees, we get almost zero. In fact, I can turn it to a point where in fact it is zero. And I'm just turning the probe uh, on the surface here. And this makes sense because this probe only measures magnetic flux in one direction, this way. You can kind of see there's like a little dot on the, on the surface there, and that's the, that's the sensor itself. And on the other two faces, there's no dot, so it, it only measures in this way. And since the magnet is polarized so that the north pole is this way, if we put the probe so that it's cutting through all those, so that it's lined up with the magnetics field, then we get the full reading. But if it's 90 degrees off, we get nothing. So anyway, so about half a Tesla at the surface, but if we move away from the surface, the reading goes down really fast, really fast. So for this far away, and the reason is that air has high reluctance to this magnetic flux. So even though the magnet is trying to push a lot of magnetic flux through the air, the air is not very good at conducting it. And that's why this drops off so quickly. There's just not a lot flowing. So when you measure a magnet, you have to specify where this flux measurement is happening. Okay, so let's measure the little electromagnets that I've made here. I'll go back to the sensitive scale, adds a decimal point, and we'll put the probe here, and it's already measuring a teeny bit, but now I'll turn the current on. And with the current on, it's doing about, you know, 10.5 millitesla. Okay, let's try the stainless steel. Little bit of residual there. With the current on, about one point four millitesla, and with it off about 0.5. And with the brass, 0.4, with almost no residual, so zero to 0.4. So um, we can tell that there's something about the material itself that determines how good of a magnet it becomes when we put it into a coil of wire and run some current through the coil. So if we were gonna graph that out, it might look something like this. I should also mention that if we put more current through the coil, we get 
more Teslas out of the end of our electromagnet. So in, uh, instead of clicking the button, I'm going to turn it up slowly on the supply. And so if you watch the current going up over here, you can see as we put more current through, we get more Teslas out the magnet. So we're getting 30 millitesla at about uh, 8 amps, and we're getting about 20 millitesla at 5 amps, and so on. Okay, let's kind of graph out what's going on here. So the, the input to our system here is the current through the wire, and the output of our system are the number of Teslas that we're getting out of our electromagnet. So when we put the probe here and we turn the current up, we're getting more Teslas out. Okay, it's pretty good. Um, as it turns out, the input to this electromagnet is the number of turns times the current that we're putting through it divided by the length of the coil. And uh, the reason that this, you know, is the case is that uh, one turn of electric, of one turn at a certain current is the same thing as two turns at half the current, right? Uh, think about it. If you're, if we drew a black box around this coil, you could not tell the difference if you were inside the middle of the coil uh, between this two turns at one amp and one turn at two amps. It's the same thing. So the unit is actually pretty convenient. It's just amps times turns divided by meters. And the meters is like the length of the coil. And the reason that we throw that in there is because this is actually like the intensity of this magnetizing field. And so if this was spread out among a whole meter, yeah, that makes sense. That's less intense than if we're all crunched up over into one little centimeter like this one is. So we include this length there because this is actually the magnetizing intensity. So you've probably heard of this BH curve before. It's, it's actually not that mysterious, but uh, for some reason, folks don't explain it sort of simply. So I hope this is making sense. I mean, it, just think of it as the y-axis B, which is the symbol for this um, magnetic flux density, is dependent on how much current and how many turns we're basically putting into it. So how good of an electromagnet and how much work are we putting into this electromagnet is basically what this graph is going to show. So we saw these three materials. We had brass, stainless steel, and steel, and we saw that each one of them has a different characteristic. So even with the same number of turns, the same current, and the same length of the coil on each one of these pretty much, the steel performed really well. Uh, the stainless steel was kind of intermediate and the brass was, was basically nothing. And I should point out that brass really is pretty close to nothing. The only reason that we saw any field coming out at all was because, um, because there's a, a little bit of air actually in here. I mean, the brass is not really playing a part, but let's, let's not worry about that too much just at the moment. Okay, so if we were going to plot out the performance of these coils, we might have a really good performer like this. So this is maybe the steel. And then we've got kind of an intermediate performer, and that's the stainless steel. And then we've got a really low performer, and that's maybe the brass. And um, what we want to do is basically come up with a, a description, you know, a number that describes how good these materials are uh, at conducting, at becoming electromagnets when we put them in a magnetic field. And as it turns out, that's basically the slope of this, of this graph, and we call that mu. So mu is uh, a description that's it's one number that describes how good these materials are. And actually, as a fun side note, there is such a thing as a negative material. The graph actually keeps going, and these are diamagnetic. So air itself, or even empty space, is actually on this graph. It's, let's, let's consider it basically brass, or air is pretty much the same thing. Air and empty space, or true vacuum, are basically the same uh, for, this, for this argument. And it has a very, very low permeability, but it's there. It's actually a, a universal constant. It's just a number. And so to make things easy, when we're talking about steel or stainless steel, what we're doing is describing how much better they are at conducting magnetic fields than air or empty space is. So a lot of times you'll see mu with a subset R, meaning relative. So uh, mu relative of steel may be like 1,000 and mu relative of air is one. I mean, that's, that's what we're measuring relative to. Uh, however, when we do the numbers later on, we'll actually plug in what the real value for air or empty space is. So just keep in mind that when you hear permeability of 1,000 or 2,000 or 100 or whatever, that's just the relative permeability uh, 
compared to air or vacuum. The actual number is something like times 10 to the minus 7. It's just not convenient to throw around. Even though we're starting to get further away from this electronic analogy when understanding magnetics, uh, it helps to keep a few things in mind. One is that in electronic circuits, we're almost always using copper as the conductor. So we don't really care about the material properties so much in electronics because it's always copper. And so copper has a certain um, resistivity to it. It's a material property. And then if you want to flow you know, an amp through a wire, you basically look up on a table to see how big the wire should be because we're not really caring about, you're not going to switch to a different material basically. Whereas with magnetics, choosing the material is actually a pretty important part of it. And they each have different um, permeabilities. Like we just said, each one of these has a different slope on the graph. Another thing to keep in mind is that there's multiple unit systems, unfortunately, for magnetics. Uh, but there's a couple of things that'll help you out. One is that the English system is almost never used. So you can't even blame this on us Yankees because the, you know, the American units or whatever are almost never used. So you can ignore these. Then, unfortunately, it seems to be about half and half split between the CGS system, which is centimeter gram second, and true SI units, which is meter kilogram second. And if you look through here, you'll probably recognize some of these uh, different units. For this video, I'm only going to use SI units. But if you're searching around on the internet and you come across, let's say, Gauss, just keep in mind that there's a conversion factor, and a Gauss is the same as a Tesla. There's just a conversion you have to do. An Ohr stead is the same as amp turn per meter. So in our previous chart here, H could be amp turn per meter, and the vertical axis is B in Tesla. This could be Gauss over here, and this could be Ohr steads over here. And it's the same concept, the same everything. It's just, you know, just different units. Um, unfortunately, the conversion factors get to be kind of weird because the geometry comes into effect. So one Tesla is 10,000 Gauss. That one's pretty easy. But the conversion between some of these other things are not so straightforward. I would recommend if you're cruising around the internet reading about this kind of stuff, just focus on one unit system. And I would recommend SI units, but it's up to you. And then when you get really comfortable with what all these different things are, then you know, just do the conversion in your head. Or just when you see something like Oersted, you just know that's amp turns per meter with a conversion factor. But until you get a really good conceptual grasp of all these different things, I would recommend sticking to one system. OK, so I keep saying that the magnetic circuit is just like the electric one, and we can do the same type of resistance, ohms, voltage kind of analysis on it. So let's, let's actually do it. We've got the simple one up here to start with. Um, let's say we're given that the voltage is 1.5, the EMF, or electromotive force. And we're also given that the resistance of the bulb is 5 ohms. Pretty easy. The current is equal to the voltage over the resistance, 0.3 amps. No problem. Now, the same kind of thing will happen for the magnetic circuit. Um, one of our givens is that the MMF, or the magnetomotive force, is 250 amp turns. And in this case, our coil has 50 turns, and we're going to put 5 amps through it, so 250. Uh, next, our circuit has kind of two resistive elements. One of them is this steel bar that makes a circuit through here, and the other element is the gap. And the total amount of reluctance, because that's basically magnetic resistance, will equal the sum of those two things. It's actually very easy. Just add them together. So we can calculate the, re the reluctance of the core, or the steel part, and then the reluctance of the air gap, add them together, and that's our total reluctance. So our total our core plus our gap. And um, if we look over at the units here, reluctance is actually um, uh, denoted by this stylized R. And I really don't like the, the weird symbols and stuff, because again, it just makes the material harder to understand. But there aren't too many. This is really it. And this is as, as advanced as the math is going to get in this video. So the reluctance for any kind of material is the length of it divided by the permeability times the area. And this is actually exactly the same as in electronics. It's just, again, we always use copper. And so we're not really starting with the resistivity of copper. But if you have a really thick copper wire, that can carry a whole lot more current. It has a lower resistance. Or if you have a short copper wire as opposed to a long one, that also has lower resistance, even though the resistivity 
the intrinsic property of copper doesn't change. It's the same in both cases, or in any case. Um, same thing here. If you know the permeability of your material, the length and the area are what determine the reluctance, or like the total resistance to magnetic flux. So let's do the core first. Um, by the way, a core is just a uh, material that's good at conducting magnetic fields. So if you're building a transformer or a motor or something, the core is basically the, the metal that's carrying this magnetic field. So in this case, the core has a length of 324 millimeters. And when you're doing the math, always use the right unit system. I, I would strongly recommend MKS. So everything in here is meter, kilogram, second. So instead of 324, it's 0.324 which is the length from, from here to here. And then the permeability of the steel, I'm estimating at 500. And remember, we talked about relative permeability. The actual permeability of empty space happens to be this number. So four pi times 10 to the minus seven is just a universal constant. It's just the way it is. It's one of those very few universal constants that uh, defines how the whole universe works and it's just there. And then the area is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's an eight millimeter diameter, and if you calculate it out, it's five times 10 to the minus five. So if you calculate all this out, it comes out to be one times 10 to the seven. And the units are a little weird. If we look over here, the units for reluctance are amp turns per Weber, or I'm gonna say Weber, because that's a little bit more comfortable. Um, don't worry too much about the units here. Just remember that the reluctance is one times 10 to the seven for this core. Okay. Now we'll do the same thing for the gap, but we're already running into a problem. What's the area of the gap? Like if we were to cut the gap with a plane through it perpendicularly, I mean, it's, it's infinite area, there's, it's air. I mean, there's no, there is no gap, <laughs> there's no area to it. So what we use is a approximation and the way to do it is to add the length of the gap, the distance to each of the dimensions in space uh, to calculate it out. So since this is a circle, I'm gonna use 0 0.004, four millimeters is the radius, plus 0 0.03, which is the length, squared times pi to get the area. If it were a square cross section, you would add the length to both the width and the depth uh, and multiply them together. And that's actually a very good approximation. And the reason we do that is because the field lines sort of bow out through this gap, right? Like you've you've seen in the, with the iron filings that the, the magnetic flux kind of tends to bow out from these air gaps. And so we use this uh, area approximation. So if we do the math for that one, we get 6.6 .6 times 10 to the six for the reluctance of the gap. And then just like with the electric circuit, the total flux and the unit of this is the Weber and uh, you can remember this one because it sounds like ampere. So amperes, Weber's. And uh, it's equal to the magnetomotive force divided by the total reluctance. And we know all these numbers. And if we plug them in, we get 1.5 times 10 to the minus five. This is great, but it's, it's actually very tough to measure this. In an electric circuit, it's easy to measure the current. We can just put an ammeter in circuit and measure it, or we could even use a clamp meter. But in magnetic circuits, it's very tough to measure the total flux. So instead, what we want to do is measure the flux density. Uh, that's something that I can measure directly with the meter over here. And to figure out the flux density, all we do is divide by the area again. So if we know the total flux is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5, and we want to know what the density is, we just divide by the area. That's pretty straightforward. So B, the flux density, uh, we'll use the area from the gap again. It's the same, the same area here as here and we get out four millitesla. Not too bad, right? Let's try it out. So if we come over here, we'll take the compass out and put the probe in. And we can see there's a little bit of residual. It's coming up at about 0.4. And if I turn the current on, lo and behold, we get about four millitesla. That's pretty cool. Uh, now, it's true that if I move the probe around, like put it over here, it drops uh, precipitously. I mean, it's only about 0.7 in the middle. If you go to the other side, it's about three. So what this is telling us is that our approximation for the area is 
close, but not great. But actually, it's pretty good considering we just went from universal constants measuring the geometry uh, to a value that's within, you know, even within 20 or 30 percent or even 50 percent is pretty good. Pretty cool. Let's do another one. Okay, so in this one, we've got a steel ring and I put 100 turns of copper on there. So this time we have the magnetomotive force of 500 because it's 100 turns at 5 amps, so 500. Uh, the total reluctance is still the reluctance of the core plus the reluctance of the gap. And it's the same math as in the previous one. I'm still estimating the permeability of the steel here at 500. Uh, 4, 4 pi e negative 7 is the permeability of free space, so we end up with a reluctance for the core and a reluctance for the gap. And one thing that's interesting here, this is 2.1 times 10 to the 7. This is 3.1 times 10 to the 6. So that tiny little air gap in this system actually has 10 times the magnetic reluctance of this whole steel core. It's a really important thing to keep in mind. Uh, air is 500 times less permeable than steel, than a lot of steels. Uh, and for some decent uh, materials used in transformers, it's even several thousand times. So if you put an air gap into your magnetic system, most of the reluctance, and in a lot of cases, all of the you know, reluctance that you have to worry about is in the air gap. So anyway, we do the, the flux. This is the total amount of magnetism flowing through the circuit, 2.1 times 10 negative 5 Weber's. And if, since we can't measure that, we, we want to measure B, which is the flux density, uh, divide by the area, and we use that same trick to estimate the area of the gap. We get 188 millitesla. So let's try it out. Now, one thing you'll notice is that we're already measuring 40 millitesla, and I'm, I'm not even flowing any power through here. So we'll turn the power on, and we're getting about 100. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a little more than half of what we estimated. But like I say, the point of this is not to, you know, the video is not to give you a lot of practice doing the math or showing how rigorous this can be. If it's within a factor of two, I'm very happy since we're starting with universal constants and geometry. And so actually getting even this close, I think, is pretty good. However, there is something to notice here. Even without any uh, current flowing, I mean, the meter is pretty close to zero. It's, it's reading, you know, 0.6 now. And if I go into the air gap without any current flowing, it's actually reading 40 millitesla. So that means that our graph here can't be quite right because H is amp turns per meter. And if it's zero, then that would mean we shouldn't be getting any B at all. So this graph is actually slightly inaccurate. Uh, there's another couple of factors to take into account here. This residual magnetism we keep seeing is something you've probably experienced yourself. If you just take a brand new plain old nail out of the package, it has a very slight influence on the compass, but not much. Whereas if we magnetize the nail by putting it into a strong magnetic field, uh, now it's quite strong or much stronger than it was. And so clearly the steel nail has the ability to retain magnetism. And so if we were gonna put this back on the graph, instead of just having a linear relationship here, uh, the actual relationship has this hysteresis to it. And so what this means is that, let's say we start off in the middle here uh, at zero magnetism. So zero applied field and also zero magnetism coming out of our electromagnet. When we apply power, it starts moving up like we said it would, and it eventually saturates, which we'll talk about in a minute. But then if we start reducing the power, we can come back to this point here so that H is zero. We're not applying any magnetic field or we're not trying to magnetize it anymore, but we still have B, we still have magnetic flux coming out of the device. Then if we start going negative, so we basically switch the polarity of our coil. So if H is amp turns per meter, now we're giving it negative amps, or basically we've flipped the polarity. It actually requires us to apply this negative polarity field to it in order to get back to zero B. And then we can keep going. It saturates again, and then comes back to this point, or over here, where it's zero power, and now it's a magnet in the other direction. And so you've probably seen this BH curve, and by now in the video, we've gotten to this point where we're talking about it. 
uh, it, it, there's this cyclic hysteresis to it, and all magnetic properties have this. There is no such thing as a perfect magnetic material, as far as I know, that only is a straight line up here uh, forever. Well, air is one. I mean, paramagnetic, diamagnetic materials have this linear relationship that goes on forever, but any ferromagnetic core is going to have this more of a shape. And so I mentioned saturation. Uh, what this means is that we can keep trying to make a better and better electromagnet by adding more turns or pushing more current through our coil. But what ends up happening is we only get a certain amount of B out. So if we're you know, measuring this electromagnet with our meter here like this, and uh, we keep putting more and more current in, eventually the graph will slide down into a flatness here. And no matter how much current we put through, we don't actually make it a better electromagnet. And this is a material property. Um, as it happens, for a lot of normally encountered magnetic materials like electrical steel and all this, the saturation point is about 1.5 Tesla. So getting above 1.5 Tesla is difficult, very difficult, because we just don't have materials that can carry that much magnetic flux. Whenever you encounter a magnet that's higher than 1.5 Tesla, like a MRI machine is commonly three Tesla, you have to use other technology like superconducting coils or, um, or just co a lot of current with coils close together. Um, remember, if we put, if the coils are close to each other like this, and we put our probe in the middle here, even if this is air, remember air still has some amount of permeability. It's just that we start losing the, um, the help from the steel. So if we're trying to make a really good magnet, using steel works up to 1.5 Tesla, and then beyond that we have to use just air or superconducting coils, basically. Okay, in this setup, we have an isolated variac with its output connected to these clips, and it goes through a clamp meter. This measures the current going through here. And then there's 100 turns on this steel core with an air gap. And the air gap has the probe for the magnet meter, the Tesla meter, stuck in there. And I've modified the Tesla meter so that its output I added this jack to the side so its output actually goes into the oscilloscope uh, and the output of the current meter also goes into the scope. So basically we're just going to plot magnetic field in the gap versus current and let's see how that looks. Okay, so I'm going to start increasing the current and at this low level you can see we've got uh, current versus time here, the magnetic field versus time here, and then this is the XY plot. So got millitesla in the y-axis and amps on the x-axis. This is pretty much the BH graph. So we're going to turn it up and you can see something starts to happen. I'm going to stop the scope so that I can turn the power off and we'll retain it here. You can see that there's definitely this saturation effect right at about 120 millitesla. So the thing behaves linearly up to a point and then breaks over and becomes pretty flat. And when a current is zero, we actually have quite a bit of retained magnetic field. In fact, it's about 80 millitesla in this uh, setup. And you can see the current is pretty high. This is topping out at about 17 amps. Um, if we scrolled through here, you could figure out exactly how many amps it takes to saturate this material. Another very important thing to keep in mind is that the this whole system is dominated by the air gap. Remember how we said that the reluctance of the air gap is much higher than the reluctance of the material itself. If we wanted to use this setup to measure the material itself without the influence of the air gap, we have to come up with another scheme of doing it. Uh, if we use the air gap to basically insert our Tesla meter in there, then we affect the whole system, and what we're actually measuring is the saturation of the whole system, including the air gap. So steel saturates much higher than 120 millitesla. The only reason that it's showing up this way on our graph is because of that air gap. So let's go back to the setup and see if we can figure out another way to do this. If we add another little coil to this metal ring, we've kind of made ourselves a simple transformer. So we've got the primary over here putting uh, the magnetic field into this uh, steel ring, and then we've got another coil over here that we're using as a sensor. And we just said that this whole thing saturates at, you know, 150 millitesla or something like that. What that would mean is that when we get up to the saturation point, we shouldn't get much additional output out of this secondary coil. This is why saturation is typically bad in your transformer design. So we're putting more and more current into here, but we're not getting any more magnetic field out because the, the system has been saturated. So what we're going to do 
is add an oscilloscope uh, probe to the second coil and then look at the voltage while we do the same experiment and see what we can get with that. Okay, so we're still looking at B with the Tesla probe here and then current going into the primary coil of our new little transformer. And then this sense voltage is the output of our transformer. So you can see I can scale up and down and everything's still pretty much the same. So I'm gonna scale up and then uh, stop just so, we, so I don't have to run current through there. Since we're doing, you know, 17 amps, that thing heats up pretty quick, so I don't like to leave it on for too long. Um, we can see the same phenomenon, same saturation and everything. And this is the voltage that we're getting out of the transformer, our secondary, basically, and it's horribly distorted. The voltage we're putting in is pretty close to a sine wave, and what we're getting out is this horrible thing here. Now, the trick is how do we use this to figure out what the magnetic flux is in the coil? So up until now, we've only been talking about currents and magnetic fields. This is the first time that voltage has cropped up. And as it turns out, the voltage is proportional to the change in magnetic field with respect to time. And that's just sort of another universal law to sort of deal with. Um, but it's convenient that we can just measure the voltage and then figure out what the magnetic field is doing in there. And since I said that the voltage is proportional to the change in magnetic field, what we want to do is mathematically integrate this. Now, we aren't going to do the math ourselves. We're actually going to use the oscilloscope to do it. So I'm going to turn on the math trace, and we can edit it. And the formula that I'm going to use is the integral of channel 8, which is the voltage that we're picking up from that sense coil, plus the voltage on channel 1. And channel 1 is just this a very simple voltage divider, just a potentiometer. And the reason that I need that is that without this offset control, the integrator is going to drift, and I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So we'll say that's fine, okay. And uh, currently, this XY plot is, is plotting uh, channel 3 on the x-axis, which is current going into the transformer, and channel 2 on the y-axis, which is the direct measurement of the magnetic field with the Tesla probe. However, if we change the y-axis to be the mathematical calculated field, look at that, it's almost exactly the same. We'll flip back and forth. So that's the actual measured field, and, and the math channel, which is the integral of the sense voltage, is this. Almost the same thing. It's actually working. I mean, it's always nice when things work, but it's kind of surprising sometimes. Now, the scale is not set up properly. This has units of microvolt, microvolt seconds, um, but the cool thing is that since we have the magnetic field probe in there, and we know that the flux is the same at all points in the circuit, because it's a circuit, so the flux is necessarily the same kind of everywhere, and the area is kind of almost the same in the gap as the core, we can use this to calibrate our system, and then we can actually use this thing to measure the real magnetic permeability of any material we want, if we can make it into a ring or make it into a transformer. Here's what I mean about the integrator drifting. So I've just got this potentiometer here that's feeding a tiny little voltage into channel one. Uh, we can put it up there. It's, it's just a, a flat, looks, looks very, it's very small, but you can see it goes up and down when I turn the potentiometer. And it's the, the integration that we set up is basically adding channel one to this. And so if it integrates a constant, it basically just splays out, but we don't want this. And so we kind of tune the pot in to give us a really decent looking BH curve. Um, I, I thought there might have been a way to do this in the scope itself, but as it turns out, this is actually easier because I have really fine control over it and it's, it's easier to just dial it in like that. And then we can go up in current again. You can see it's, it's starting to separate a little bit here, so you can use this to kind of dial it in just right. Um, and then another interesting quirk is that um, to, get the, uh, to get the plot centered on zero, I'm using the level trigger uh, and triggering off the sense voltage that comes back. And so we want this thing to trigger at basically just the right level so that it's plotting the zero at just the right way. Okay, let's take a look at another material. This is a ferrite transformer. Um, it's two separate coils wound on there. And previously we were looking at this steel ring that I made myself. But this is a real ferrite transformer that's um, purpose-built. Now we can't put the probe into the gap anymore because there is no gap. So we just connected the input power to here and we're going to use our sense and integrate technique on that side to see what this looks like. 
Okay, here we go. I'm going to start increasing the power, and then I'm going to stop the oscilloscope so I can turn the power down. And uh, let's see what we've got here. First, you'll notice that the um, BH curve looks quite a bit different than it did for the steel. Um, some things to notice, the, remain, the retained magnetism when the power goes to zero is actually quite a bit less than the steel. So the last vocabulary word for the video is the coercivity of a material, which describes how much magnetism it retains when the field has been turned off. So this BH curve actually gives us quite a lot of information about the material. One, the permeability, which is the slope of the line, uh, like you know what we saw in the earlier part of the video. The saturation, which is where this thing levels off and you just can't get any more magnetism out of it. And the coercivity, which is how much magnetism remains when you cross zero. Another interesting thing that you can get from this graph is the area inside this curve. Uh, if you add up all the area inside here, this describes how lossy the transformer is uh, based on the core losses. Um, if you, you have to basically spend energy to make this core into a magnet, and then you flip back the other way each time, each cycle. So if you're feeding this thing AC, and it's taking a lot of energy to create a magnet, then you have to switch everything around and undo everything you did. So you, for a transformer, you typically want something with a low coercivity, a high permeability, and a really high saturation. The problem is that you can't always get everything that you want, but you can get what you need. And so, for example, in low frequency transformers, the best material choice is typically steel. Um, it has a high saturation. It, the coercivity is reasonably high, uh, but that's kind of okay because it only flips polarity 60 times a second, which is relatively low. So even though we waste a little bit of energy with this coercivity problem, the fact that the saturation is really high and the permeability is also quite high, that ends up being the best material choice for a transformer that operates at 50 or 60 hertz. Now, if for higher frequency transformers like this little toroid, this could be designed to work at maybe 10 to 100 kilohertz or something like that. And in this case, that high coercivity would be a really big problem. At, at 10 or 100 kilohertz, we'd be wasting so much power that it wouldn't really be a good material choice. And so instead, these little toroids are often made of ferrite, and ferrite has a lower coercivity, as we saw on the oscilloscope. So even though the saturation is also lower, when you do all the math and figure out how much material would I need, how much does it cost, how hard is it to process, Ferrite ends up being a better choice for high-frequency transformers, and steel ends up being the best choice for low-frequency transformers. Also, don't confuse the shape with the material choice. Like, for example, this is a toroid, but it's actually a steel core. Um, so is this, right? This is a, a thing that I cut up myself. But they make toroidal transformers out of steel. Uh, it just happens to be that most of these uh, smaller, high-frequency transformers are toroidal and made out of ferrite. Um, there are also ferrite transformers that are not toroidal, for example, this one. So what's the difference between a toroid and an uh, e-core or something that's not a toroid? If, if these are both ferrite transformers, why would I pick one or the other? Again, it comes down to more of a manufacturing cost balance type thing. Winding a toroid is actually relatively expensive. Um, if, you, if you're holding a roll of wire, try to think about the difficulty in sort of winding it around a toroid. It's actually not that easy. You need a specialized winding machine. The benefit is that a toroid has no air gaps and it's essentially self-shielding, like all of the flux is contained within that core. Whereas this E-core has some sharp edges and you have to join it together and so there might be a gap. And um, again, it's, it's really kind of more of a manufacturing thing. Don't think that toroids and other types of transformers are all that different. It's just a, a different way to accomplish the same thing. There's also quite a few different kinds of ferrite. See, these are marked 43, and then these have a little sticker on there, and then this one is painted. Uh, oftentimes, the toroids that are painted like this one are actually not ferrite. It's powdered iron. So they take uh, iron powder and mix it with epoxy and form it into a toroid. And, you know, these things are all relatively similar. Um, usually the differences involve how well it works at a specific frequency range. So for example, maybe this is really great at a megahertz and this other one is really great at 100 kilohertz. But 
really it all comes down to the BH curve diagram. So they have differing amounts of coercivity and differing uh, saturation points and different permeability, but it has this additional problem of the BH curve being dependent on the frequency at which you test it. And so not only do all these variables exist, they also change depending what frequency you're putting through this thing, which is why magnetics get to be fairly complicated. And then, of course, if you're using a square wave, that's a combination of frequencies, and so it, it, it can get complicated right in a hurry. Let's finish up by taking a look at a couple uh, unusual magnetic things that you might find in everyday items. This is a flyback transformer from an old CRT television set, and you'll notice that there's a little gap in here. It's a ferrite core, but there's an air gap in here. And at first you might think, well, it's, you know, it's just manufacturing tolerance. They obviously snapped this thing together and didn't quite make it. But actually, this is intentional. You can see they even put some glue over here to set the gap thickness very precisely. And the way that they designed this thing, they actually want there to be some extra reluctance in the core. At first you might think, that's pretty dumb. Why didn't they just use a smaller core? That would achieve the same thing, right? Uh, as it turns out, not quite, because the air gap, the reluctance in this air gap, helps this thing store power on each cycle that goes through. And the way that a flyback transformer works is that you want to like, charge up the magnetic field, and then you stop charging it up, and it, the magnetic field collapses and goes into the other coil that's in here. I think the purists would claim this is actually a coupled inductor, not really a transformer, because of the way it's used. Uh, but the trick is that the air gap actually allows it to store energy between cycles, and that's how it works. Um, you might find other transformers that have carefully controlled air gaps as well. Not the most common thing in the world. Now, here's one. So this is actually an iron core. In fact, this is an inductor. This is not a transformer because it's only got two leads. But you can see they put some wood or some cardboard or something in here to, to make an air gap, even in this iron core. Again, because they didn't want too much magnetic field in here. This adds reluctance and prevents the field from getting too high. Another way to achieve this, which is pretty weird, this is a microwave oven transformer, and this is the primary, and this is the secondary, and if you look in there, you can see there's actually metal that's shorting out the magnetic field. So if we were going to draw the magnetic field circuit diagram for this thing, it would actually have a short in there. Um, and if you knock those pieces out, this is what they look like. It's a shunt, a magnetic shunt, and it, it serves the same purpose of putting a gap in these transformers. You can sort of control how much magnetic field goes through the transformer. And the point of these shunts is to limit how much current you can get out of the secondary. Um, the way that a microwave oven works is it tries to pull a large amount of current out of this coil, and it relies upon the transformer doing the current limiting. And that current limiting is achieved by bleeding off some of the magnetic field and making the transformer less effective as it gets up into higher currents. Even though it seems like the ideal material would have no power loss, sometimes that's actually exactly what you want. In an application like this, these little ferrite beads are clipped on to this USB cable. Here, this one clips on, but these are molded on. And the idea is that the ferrite will prevent high frequency noise from going through here. Um, and, the, and actually, if this is lossy, that's even better because we want to get rid of this high frequency noise. We don't want to couple it to anywhere. So sometimes you actually want a material that is purposefully lossy because we want to get rid of that high frequency signal, which is interference in this case. In the case of magnetic storage media like this, we actually want a material with a really high coercivity, right? Because we want to set the magnetic information in here and then have it not change until we're ready to set it again. So these typically have higher coercivity and the, you know, the permeability and that sort of thing doesn't really matter that much in this case. So the point is that depending what you're doing with magnetics, you can search for a BH diagram that sort of meets your need and then make sure that the frequency that you're running at uh, you get that BH characteristic at that uh, desired frequency. Um, there's, of course, a whole lot more to cover, but I think this actually does cover all the aspects of um, magnetic circuit design, and uh, I hope some of this has made sense and made it easier for you to get started in the field. Once you start reading on the Internet, you'll find that people try to dump the math on you, 
And it's not necessary. I think it's really much better to sort of keep things conceptual until you really, really need the math for a specific reason. And then you can dive in and do the, the heavy duty analysis. Okay, see you next time. Bye.